Well, before we get started with the talk, um, I wanted to begin with just a few acknowledgements of people who have made the talk possible. And then I'll be introducing our speaker, Cecilia Munoz, who's gonna be talking about her book, More Than Ready, which contains all kinds of wonderful advice for those of you who are thinking about how to manage your careers, how to move forward in your careers, what, what are the right choices to make and how to find great satisfaction and joy during that process. So first of all, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Dean Austin Parrish here at UC Irvine School of Law for his support of the Future of Latinos Project, including our Reimagining the Latinx uh, Experience series. Also Interim Director Bryant Garth at the American Bar Foundation. Uh, we founded, we launched this project at the foundation and they have been strong supporters ever since. I also wanted to thank Robbie Kadri who handles all the events for the UC Irvine Law Centers for his ongoing support of our efforts. And Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, my wonderful research assistant who is a law student here at UC Irvine and helps me to put together the series and make sure that everything runs smoothly. So her contributions are truly invaluable. Now, what I wanted to do is turn to our speaker for today. This is Cecilia Munoz. She's a national leader in public policy and public interest technology. She has nearly three decades of experience in the nonprofit sector and eight years of service on President Obama's senior team. She joined New America in 2017 um, as a vice president, and there she leads local initiatives and builds a team on public interest technology. And uh, I have read her wonderful book, and in there she describes how during her time in the Obama administration, she really realized how critical technology would be to the future of public interest and public policy, and that government was a little behind the curve. And so she decided to get involved with the New America Initiative. She returned to New America as a senior advisor in early 2021 after taking leave to lead the domestic and economic policy team for the Biden-Harris transition. Now, she, as I mentioned, served for eight years on a, President Obama's senior staff. She was first the director of intergovernmental affairs and then served for five years as director of the Domestic Policy Council. She came to that position, those positions with truly a wealth of experience because before doing that service, she spent 20 years at the National Council of La Raza, which is now known as Unidos US. And that is the nation's largest Hispanic policy and advocacy organization. And she's also a senior fellow at Results for America, which addresses the use of data and evidence in policymaking. She received a prestigious MacArthur Fellowship in 2000 for her work on immigration and civil rights. And she uh, advises foundations and serves on foundation boards. And so she has a lot of wisdom to share. And so I will turn it over to Cecilia Munoz to discuss her book, More Than Ready. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks to all of you who, who are joining the conversation today. Um, I should say that I am zooming in from overseas. You can see that it's dark where I am. What you can't see is that it's also really stormy where I am and my internet connection has been a little, a little shaky. So hopefully it will hold up for the duration of the conversation, but I did just disappear from the last meeting briefly that I was in. So if I disappear unexpectedly, I will do my best to come right back. Um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with all of you. And I wanna emphasize that I wanna make it as much of a conversation as possible. So I'm gonna describe a little bit, tell some stories um, that I wrote about in More Than Ready um, and that are sort of lessons from that, that I took from over the course of my career. Um, but they're designed to stimulate conversation about um, particularly for folks who are in early stages of their careers, figuring out what they wanna do how they want to make a difference, maybe dealing with the challenges of doubt or imposter syndrome or a variety of things that you'll hear about. Um, uh, and so I, I would really like to ask that you think about what you might ask and what we might have a conversation about. Um, uh, and there are, it's all on the table. Like I, I am comfortable answering questions about public policy. I'm happy to answer sort of career direction questions 
questions about how to balance work and family, like whatever it is, feel free to, to ask. There's no question that's out of bounds. Um, so as you heard, I wrote a book called More Than Ready, which looks at some of the challenges that, um, that I face, faced over the course of you know, more than 30 years in public policy working in Washington. Um, but not so much from a policy perspective, but from a personal one. I've, as you heard, I've worked in Washington for more than 30 years. 20 of them were at a civil rights organization. Eight of them were in the Obama White House. I learned a lot about myself, about what holds me back, about what it takes to push myself forward with integrity and effectiveness. But I also interviewed seven women of color whom I admire when I was preparing the book. And I learned that the challenges that I faced are the same as the ones that they face. And we think that we're facing them alone, but we're not alone at all. We just don't talk about it. So my book is an effort to start the conversation and that's the kind of conversation I hope that we'll have today. So I'm gonna to focus today on three things that I've learned from being in the trenches in Washington, but they're not really about Washington as much as they are about being a professional, a professional woman, a woman of color in situations that are often dominated by men and by men who are not people of color. So I'm gonna talk about doubt. I'm gonna talk about daring to be disliked and I'm gonna talk about kindness. So first doubt. Um, I was, when I was interviewing the women that I talked to in preparing the book, I was so taken by learning that we all had the same experience and we all had common experiences with doubt. There were big times when we doubted ourselves, but there were also big moments when we noticed that the people who were in the room with us doubted our ability to do what we were doing and, and doubted whether we belonged doing what we were doing. So one story um, that I tell in the book um, has to do with my time in the White House. Um, as you heard, Rachel described that for three years of the eight years of the Obama administration, I was in a job called Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, which is the person who manages the president's relationships with state and local and tribal governments. And then after three years, I was promoted. I became the president's domestic policy advisor. And the chief of staff at the time of my promotion uh, spoke to a couple of journalists and told them that my being promoted was the last straw for him that, that, that ultimately made him leave the White House. And he gave these journalists the clear impression that he thought I was an affirmative action hire, somebody who was promoted because of who I am, but not necessarily because of what I know how to do. Um, and the reason that I know this is because those journalists wrote books about the first Obama term. And this was in those books. So uh, I, to be honest, I, um, that cost me a couple of years of confidence. And I would walk into the morning meeting. I was a member of the senior staff. There would be a meeting in the chief of staff's office. This, and the, you know, the, for the vast majority of the five years I was in that role, it was a different chief of staff than the, than the one who had talked to these journalists. But I found myself thinking, well, shoot, if the last guy who had this job thought that about me, how do I know that the people sitting around this table don't think the same thing. Um, and every woman that I spoke to in preparing the book had a similar story where somebody communicated to them that they were, you know, this notion that we're kind of onto you. We know you don't belong here doing what you're doing. You're only here because somebody decided um, that, that, you know, they needed to check a box. This is not an uncommon experience. But the other thing I learned was that while all of us had a similar experience, we also all developed strategies for dealing with that kind of doubt, right? We learned that people around us had doubts about whether we belonged and we let their doubts become our doubts. Um, and so we all developed the same strategies for addressing that doubt. Um, and so I'm gonna share those with you. The first is we all over-prepared, right? So the way that we um, addressed our own doubts about whether, whether we truly belonged in that situation, whether we truly belonged in the jobs that we held, was to make sure we were good and prepared for every meeting that we walked into. So I had a big fat binder that I brought home every weekend to prepare for all of my meetings for the following week. I made sure I did my homework because in, when you're in that kind of situation, when you, you're the only person like you in the room or you're the first person like you to hold a position, um, you feel like you don't have the room to make a mistake, right? Or you feel like if you make a mistake, it's not just your mistake, you're, you're making that mistake on behalf of everybody who's like you. 
So all of us, uh, we talked about being ultra prepared for everything that we did. So that's one strategy. There is, I think if you're a person of color in particular or a woman, there is no fake it till you make it, right? Either we all really, really made sure we did our homework. And the second strategy was um, to relentlessly ask for feedback. Um, I, when I was at the White House, I found people that it was safe to ask where I could go into their offices and close the door and say, you know, that meeting we were just in didn't go well. What, what did I not see? What did you see that I might not have seen? Where did I go off course? What can you tell me about how I might up my game? Which is, that's a difficult thing to do. It feels very risky to ask for that kind of feedback to admit that maybe this, I, you know, my performance just now wasn't 100% perfect. But I've learned that asking for feedback is actually a sign of strength. Um, and that what it communicates is that I know that I'm human, that you know, I'm not going to be 100% on my game all of the time, and that the situation that we're in is super challenging. And so I'm communicating to you that I know I can up my game, and I want information from you to help me do that. I did that. I didn't do it with everybody. I wouldn't have done it with the chief of staff who said the thing about me. But I did find people that it was safe um, to have that kind of conversation with. And I tried very much to also be a person that my colleagues could come to to say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with something. Help me, help me find my way. So preparing, doing your homework, and asking for feedback. Uh, not just my, my own strategies for dealing with doubt, but also the strategies of the women that I spoke to, all of whom were successful, all of whom were women of color, all of whom confronted the same things. Um, so overcoming doubt is, is my first theme. Second one I want to talk about is about daring to be disliked. So when you work in public service, um, you get attacked, right? It, it comes with the territory. When I accepted the job from President Obama to work in the White House, I knew that that would happen. Um, uh, to be honest, it still happens to me right now. If you were to, you know, to Google me, you would find some of the things that you know, uh, people say about me or some of the narratives that they've constructed about who I am and what my, my, my role in the government was, um, which it may or may not have any relationship to the truth. But the point is that I knew it would happen. And, uh, and I accept that that's what happens when you're in public service. Um, and I, I, I decided that I was gonna focus, stay focused on my own integrity and on the North Star of why I went into government in the first place, and that that was gonna be enough. And so that's really the lesson that I derived from that experience is that having a North Star is really, really important. Um, understand why you're in a particular role and what it is that you're trying to achieve and stay focused on that. So if I were to focus, say, on the people who are attacking me and on what they're saying and whether or not they like me, um, then, then I'll, I'll be focused on that. I'll make decisions which drive towards that as a goal. But they, those are not necessarily the same decisions that I would make or if, if my goal were to make the best possible policy decisions to move the ball forward for the people that I'm serving as much as possible. Those are goals that may not be in alignment with each other. And so it's important that being liked isn't your goal, but rather that you're focused on the reason that you're there and what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So I, I would say having a North Star is everything. So to use an example from another sector, if you're the, say the principal of a school, Right. One goal is to make sure that the students in your school get the best possible education under your care. And another goal is to is for, you know, to be popular for everybody to like you. When you say making budget decisions in that kind of a job, if your goal is for everybody to like you, you will make decisions that help you accomplish that goal. But they may be in direct conflict with the goal of making sure you do the best possible job educating the students under your care. So having a North Star is everything. And a, a couple pieces of advice that I got, both when I was doing the work at, at the White House, um, but also when I was preparing, um, preparing the book, um, had to do with um, where you get your feedback from uh, on this question of whether or not you're liked or whether or not you're maintaining your integrity. Uh, I, I interviewed a woman for my book named Jody Archambault. She's a Native American woman from the Standing Rock tribe. 
And she faced a lot of the same challenges that I faced. She took a lot of criticism from within her community. And she didn't worry so much about criticism that she took from outside of the indigenous community because to what, the way she put it was, look, people outside of, of my community, to them, um, an anachronism, they hardly know that we are people who are you know, alive and active in this time. But the criticism, she said, that she got from her own community was the one that really made her pause, that really made her think. And she decided that her North Star was gonna be imagining that she were relaying her work to her grandmothers. And she said, I knew if, if I felt that my grandmothers would be okay with the decisions that I was making, that, that, that I was maintaining my integrity and that I didn't have to worry about the criticism that I was taking from here and there. So that's another way of thinking about what your North Star is. And then the other piece of advice that I got when I went into government from a colleague whose name is Deepak Bhargava, he ran an organization called Community Change. Uh, and he now teaches at the City University of New York. And he said, just make sure that you get your love at home. And what he meant by that was, if you're trying, if, if, if what you're going to work every day to achieve is to be loved, <laughs> You, you, again, you're gonna make decisions that aim at that, but they may not be great decisions, but probably if you're in a role in public service, you're also gonna be really frustrated because there are de definitely gonna be people who don't love you no matter what you try to do. But if you, and boy, this helped me a lot. If you know who you are and your people, whoever they are, know who you are and why you're there and you know, doing the work that you're doing, then, then that's enough. That's where, you know, you get your grounding there and then you can go into work and, and do the work that you need to do, whether or not people are happy with you and do it with integrity, whether or not people are happy with you. Because when you go home at the end of the day, whoever your people are, whether it's your family, whether it's your close circle of friends, whether it's your dog, like whoever, it, whoever is, whoever the people are around you who know who you are and understand what you're there to do, if that's where you're getting your love, then you don't have to worry about being liked in, in your work. And so daring to be disliked is the other theme that I wanted to raise with you today. And then the third one that I wanna talk about before we have more of a give and take is, is kindness. Now, I, I happen to think that kindness is deeply, deeply misunderstood as a leadership quality. Um, we, the qualities we think we want in our leaders, decisiveness, toughness, uh, none of that is incompatible with kindness. But I have to say, I'm someone who tries to walk through the world with kindness and people mistake it for weakness and they're wrong. <laughs> um, what I've learned is that kindness, empathy, relating to the other human beings that I'm in the room with, whether or not I agree with them, um, is a leadership quality. And it's a leadership quality that I think isn't particularly well understood. Um, and frankly, if we had more recognition of it as a leadership quality, I think the world would be in a very different place than it is right now. So to illustrate what I mean by this as an example, again, drawing from my experience in government, I was in a role called the Domestic Policy Council. I, that meant that I was responsible for driving policy decisions, the ones that were ultimately going to land on the president's desk. And as President Obama used to say, you know, the one the decisions that land on his desk are not the easy ones, right? They're not the ones um, that where there's an obvious answer and the answer doesn't come with, you know, a lot of pain or agony to it, right? The easier decisions can be made down the food chain from the president. The ones that filter up to him are the ones that people are really struggling with. And sometimes the reason that they're struggling is because his team doesn't agree because the the you know, it's a, it's a difficult decision. There's not an obvious answer. And members of his cabinet uh, are in, you know, in, in very different places. And so my job was to make sure that he understood the issue, but also that he understood the disagreement that was happening and that he had the information that he needed in order to make a good decision where his advisors didn't all land on one recommendation for him. Um, so you might imagine in the cabinet of a president of the United States that, for example, the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of Labor might not agree on everything. You know, their, their jobs are very different. They focus on different aspects of our economy and they're not necessarily always gonna be aligned, right? There's not two, two 
it's not too difficult to imagine that that might be true. In that situation, my job literally would be sitting across from the president in a, in a meeting with the people who were disagreeing with each other um, and making sure, my job was obviously to understand the policy and to make sure that the policy decision and the implications and the data were presented accurately to him. But also very importantly, my job was to make sure that the Secretary of Labor and the Secretary of Commerce who, Commerce, who were in a disagreement, that they each got to say their say and present their data and present their perspective. And my job was to make sure that they felt like they were treated fairly, like they got to give him the information that they really wanted him to have. And, the, and so that requires reading the room. It requires putting myself in their shoes so that I understand why they feel passionately about something. And it requires giving them the space to present what they need to present um, and to feel like they were treated fairly. Because at the end, I had to do all of that. Usually those meetings were never longer than an hour, right? So um, at the end of the day, he has to make a decision and one of them is going to prevail and one of them is not going to prevail. But if they feel like they were treated fairly, if they feel like the process was fair and my responsibility was the process, then they were in a position to go out and enthusiastically uh, defend his decision and implement his decision, even if they didn't get their way. Um, and so while my job as domestic policy advisor was to, to know the policy and make sure to present it accurately to the president. And you know, look, I may have a career in public policy, like I know my way around public policy, but my superpower in that job was not my policy chops. It was my empathy. It was the, the kindness thing. It was my ability to read the human beings in the process with me and make sure that they got what they were needed in order to, in order to get a fair shake. So that's what I mean about kindness being a leadership quality. Um, and for all of the toughness and bluster that we certainly that we see in the environment around us that we're hearing every day that like you can't turn on cable news without seeing it. You can't log on to Twitter without seeing it. Look, I'm here to tell you that I think that that approach is not getting us particularly far, but an approach that's about listening approach that's about acknowledging the humanity of the people that you're in an argument with. Look, and I recognize that in these times, that is a really, really hard thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, an approach which basically acknowledges we're, we're in this together, whether or not we agree with each other, it look, is more likely to get to, to get to answers and get to results and to get to results that allow people to understand, even when they disagree, that ultimately we're part of the same enterprise and, we're, and, and we have to find a way to move forward together. So overcoming doubt, having a North Star to hold on to when you get criticism, carrying yourself with kindness. These are not just strategies that I developed for myself. They're strategies that all of the women that I spoke to that when I was preparing more than ready, identified with, related to, and developed for themselves. So here's the thing. We think we're going through this alone, especially if you are a first, the first person in a role like yours or an only, the like only person in the room like you. Um, we think we're going through this alone and we think that admitting that this is challenging and that we face real challenges, things that we struggle with, we think that's a sign of weakness. And I'm here to tell you that we have these challenges in common and confronting them as we do is really a sign of strength. Um, so the thing I most want you to hear from me, from the process of writing the book, but most importantly, from the vantage point of more than 30 years in public service, is that none of us is alone. And more importantly, I really believe this down to my bones, you have what it takes to bring about the changes that our country and our planet so badly need. Um, the people who sit with you at whatever tables you are at may not know that they need what you bring, but I promise you they need what you bring. Um, and the most important thing is that you know that they need what you bring. And that's the thing that I, I feel like I've had to learn over and over again when I have doubts, and we all do, it's the human thing, is that I need to find the source of strength that reminds me. And frankly, there's also data to lean on that reminds me that, you know, I may frequently, I'm the person that brings diversity into the room, 
I'm frequently the only person that brings the particular perspective of my experience and my knowledge base of my own community into the room. But here's the thing that I know for sure, the data tells me that if I'm in the room and if there is diversity in the room and if I am fighting for further diversity in the room, the group of people that I'm with are gonna make better decisions, right? There's reams of evidence to support that. Um, that a homogenous group is just less likely to fully understand the problem that they're wrestling with and to fully understand the world that they're dealing with. So it's important whether or not they understand that they need what you bring, it's important that you understand that they need what you, you bring. So do the work, be prepared. Remember that your perspective matters, even when the people around you don't know that it does. But also, I guess I would say, find ways to watch out for each other. We really, it really is true that we're the leaders that the world needs right now. And frankly, the people who most need to understand that is us. So that's why I wrote More Than Ready. That's why I gratefully agreed uh, to come and be part of this conversation with all of you. And that's why I'm really hoping that you have a lot of questions and a lot of things that you want to share. Um, I think my understanding is you can do it in the chat. We may also be able to unmute you so that we can talk directly. Um, but the, the whole point of this, especially if you're students, if, especially if you're thinking about how you want to make a difference in the world, um, I'd love to know what you're thinking about, what you're worrying about, what you want to know. So the floor is yours. And I guess, Elizabeth, you're going to be moderating the conversation. So uh, thank you very much for those wonderful remarks. And now we really do want to hear from you. Um, we actually modified our format a little so you can put your questions in the Q&A function, but we also want you to have an opportunity to speak directly. So we have a way to unmute you so you can tell us about your own experiences, questions you've had, challenges you've had, further insights you would like to hear about. Um, so please feel free, the floor really is yours. And in the meantime, while we wait, oh, I see we have something in the Q and A. Yep, we do have a, a question. Um, were there times that you disagreed with the policies that came into effect and how did you deal with those moral conflicts? It's a great question. And it's frankly, it's one that any policymaker makes because um, perfection is kind of not available in public policy, honestly. Like if you think about all of the times when we have made progress, all of them, like let's say the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s, those bills were far from perfect. I mean, they were huge, huge advances. We, we rightfully celebrate them as moments of real pride and real progress. They were also the result of compromises and they didn't go nearly far enough. Every bill that I've worked on in more than 30 years um, on immigration, on education, on healthcare, like you name it. Not one of them was perfect, not one. I had disagreements with 100% of them. Um, that's just the nature of policymaking. Like perfection is not available. Uh, President Obama used to say, your job when you're in office, to use a football analogy, <laughs> um, is to move the ball down the field. Um, and he would say, I will take better every time. In other words, perfect may not be available because you need to get you know votes from the Congress of the United States, which is a very frustrating institution. Um, and you have to get as much consensus as possible among the people of the United States who don't always agree with each other. So perfection may not be on offer, but he would say, but if you have a chance to make things better, even if it's not all the way better, he said, that's your job. And he said, I will, I'll take better every time. So in that sense, yes, <laughs> I, um, I was always aware of the um, imperfections of what we were able to do, of the limitations in what we were able to do. Um, but it's also true that I went in to serve a president who I knew wasn't going to ask me to compromise my integrity, right? It's one thing to say, you know what, the Affordable Care Act has some pieces in it that, you know, that we had some pieces in it that we wanted and they got dropped out in the final package. Um, and it could have been much better than it turned out to be. Um, and that's just kind of how the process works. But it's another thing to say, the boss is asking me to do something that I think is morally wrong. And look, we have watched you know, recently presidents ask that of their staffs. 
Um, I worked for a guy who I knew was never going to ask me to be unethical. And I worked for a president whose policy views I believed in. And, uh, and that, so in that sense, the answer to your question is no. I, like he never asked me to do something that I thought was morally wrong. Um, look, it's possible that you're asking this question in the context of immigration policy, because this comes up a lot. You know, I talked about, you know, you get attacked when you're in, when you're in public office. And the thing that I get attacked about the most was being associated with immigration enforcement. I'm an immigration policy activist. I have been my whole career. Um, and what I'll say about that is that the, the thing that, that, that the Obama administration tried to do was change how enforcement policy is structured. Um, it was not on offer to eliminate immigration enforcement. Like that's, that was not available to us as an option. But we did try to change its focus um, and, and in order to focus resources on folks who had recently arrived as opposed to folks who were long-term residents of the country. And we succeeded in doing that in the time that we were in office. And all of that work was undone by President Obama's successor. Um, so, but it, look, and I'm a Latina, immigration enforcement is a very uncomfortable subject, needless to say, in my community. Um, but I worked for a president who I knew wasn't gonna ask me to do something that I didn't think was, was making progress. Uh, in the ways that we were able to make progress. And, and so the, the, so while a piece of the, of the answer to your question is yes, because policy is never perfect, on the big fundamentals, on the things that, that might tug at your conscience, the answer is no. I'm, I'm happy to say that my goal was to walk out of there with my integrity intact, and, and I'm hopeful that I did. Thank you. We have another question from Donna Hernandez. Um, what made you choose public policy as a career in the first place? And was it your first choice? Oh, I love this question um, because it was not my first choice. I, um, so I went to undergraduate, um, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Michigan um, and then my graduate work at the University of California at Berkeley. And I was fortunate enough that I had the space to work as a volunteer when I was at Berkeley. Um, and I, uh, volunteered at a legal clinic that was offering services to immigrants. And um, that experience made me think that what I was meant to do like the, was direct service, to work at an organization that like had clients and would be able to um, uh, do work to help meet their needs. Um, and so I moved to Chicago after finishing graduate school and I ended up running uh, an immigration services program this is a million years ago in the 80s, which was the last time that Congress passed a law that allowed undocumented immigrants to legalize. And I was running the legalization program for the Archdiocese of Chicago. And right, I walked into that experience feeling like my destiny is to be someone who offers services to people. And I learned that I sucked at that, honestly. Um, and while my program was very successful, we have the largest legalization program in the city, we have legalized thousands of people. Um, I had real trouble letting go of the faces and the stories of people who didn't qualify. And at one point, um, I had a conversation with a reporter and I described my job as, it's like watching people be pushed off a cliff knowing that you can only help some of them. Those are not the words of a person who loves their work <laughs> um, or who's good at the, the balancing act that their work requires. And so, but I also learned in that job that the, our clients had a lot of, there were a lot of advocacy needs and that I was good at aggregating what we were seeing in the way that our clients were being treated by the law and the other needs that they faced in their lives. And I was good at presenting that information to policymakers. And so by kind of failing as a direct service person, I found my voice as an advocate. Um, and that's ultimately that, um, you know, light bulb moment is what led me to Washington and to a career in public policy. So I did not start out thinking that I was going to be a policy person. I did not ever go to public policy school. Um, I'm also not a lawyer. Um, but I found my voice as an, as an advocate um, by doing the work and by discovering what I was not good at. And I like to tell that story, especially with audiences of students, because 
I think it's a totally legitimate way to find out what you're good at doing is discovering what you're not so good at doing and at proving yourself wrong when you set an initial goal for yourself. I think that's okay. Um, and actually, I think it can be really, really important as a, as a strategy to find out kind of what you belong doing. I have this theory I think of as like the continuum theory of if, if what you want to do with your life is to make a difference. There are an infinite number of points on the continuum and they're all valid. Like, so if being like a community organizer is over on this end of the spectrum and like working in government is over in this end of the spectrum, there, you could be a lawyer, you could be a policy advocate. There's like a million other points. You could be do direct service. Your job is to find where you belong on the continuum, right? And so I, you heard me describing my experiences. I found my voice as an advocate. Like I felt, um, I felt like I was not in the right place when I was doing direct service. And when I was an advocacy in an advocacy role, I felt like I was in the right place. I like I, it was what I thought about when I woke up in the morning. And that's what you're looking for is the work that you're thinking about when you wake up in the morning that makes you feel energized. Um, you're fine. You're looking for the place on the continuum where you belong. Well, you know, I wanted to just build on the first question, which was about, you know, have you ever had a moral principle and you didn't want to compromise that principle because you have a wonderful story in the book about the State of the Union address and how there was something you thought was very important to include. And so your North Star was saying, this is the direction. And I thought that story of how you kept persisting was so interesting. And I thought it might be a nice example of how you make sure your principles are represented while acknowledging, you know, you don't get everything you want. Yeah. Thank you. For, I'm so, it makes me happy that you that you appreciated the book. So this was President Obama's first State of the Union address. And um, right, so everybody from every advocacy community was very eager to hear what he was going to say about their, their thing. So like the whole climate change movement was very focused on what he was going to say. And the whole foreign policy establishment is very focused on what he's going to say. And we were in an economic downturn. And you know, that was, that was going to be a really important focus of the speech. And the immigration world was, and President Obama was a very eloquent man. And so everybody like was hoping for like a, a section, pages and pages on their stuff. And of course, he can't do that, that the speech would be hours and hours long. So the immigration world was like firing off, here's the 15 points we want him to make. And I'm thinking, oh man, not only is there not going to be a section in the speech, but like, I got to fight to make sure there's a sentence in the speech. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what the dynamic was. And um, David Axelrod, who was the uh, senior advisor to President Obama, was responsible for messaging and ultimately responsible for the speech, um, you know, was, was doing the work and the speech is very closely held uh, as it's under development. And so when I got a chance to see what was in the speech, there was a sentence, but it was it was only half of what I knew he needed to say. <laughs> it was um, the enforcement minded half, the you know the part that was going to speak to the Congress members in Arizona, Democrats and Republicans, I might say, who were worried about the border. But the part about immigrants being an asset and about we need to do the right thing to make sure, especially that undocumented people can can legalize their status, was not there. And I knew two things. I knew that what the president needed from me was to make sure that the that we at least got the balance right. Um, right? That I was his policy expert on the issue. My job was to make sure he wasn't going to get in trouble by not fully saying the right thing. So I knew that. And I also knew that David Axelrod had everybody and their brother coming to him to fix whatever their portion of the speech was. Um, and that he, his job was not to appease me or to appease the movement people that were you know, in my face. His job was to make sure the president gave the best possible speech for the whole country and the moment that the country was in, which meant a focus, frankly, on the economy, which was still in an epic downturn. Um, and, and so I needed to find a way for David to hear what I needed to tell him, what President Obama needed me to tell him. Um, right, this is where the empathy thing is also really important. Like, it, it, it was not 
I, you know, I couldn't just march down there and be in David's face and, and yell at him and tell him, look, here's what this needs to say, because he wasn't going to be able to hear me. And he had lots of other people in his face for a lot of other things. Um, so I found a way, um, I found a way to, to express it that he could hear. And I think this is actually really, really essential. Um, and I will tell you, I have this debate with my daughters. I have two daughters who were in their 20s. Um, and for them, it's very important to express the truth. And, and they're not wrong about that. That like what, whatever their truth is, they need to say it and make sure that it's out there, whether or not people are in a position under, to understand. And I, I understand why that is. That as a strategy would not have worked in that moment. I needed to understand where David was and explain to him why he needed to have both, both halves of the sentence. Uh, and, and I did, I found a way for, I found a way to be heard, even though, you know, I wasn't able to express the whole truth of everything that in a perfect world, I would like the president to say in this speech. And, and the balance was there. Um, and, and so that's an example of not just being persistent, but of finding a strategy that meets somebody where they are which is different than I need them to hear the, the whole truth all the time. But I will say, I, I agonized a lot about when are the times where I just need to lay it on the line and make sure people understand what they're not seeing? And when are the times that I need to calibrate to make sure that they understand what they absolutely need to know in order for us to move forward? I can't promise you I got that balance right every time. Um, but I can promise you that my radar was going through that every minute that I was there. And that's part of our job, unfortunately, right? Especially as people of color, especially as people um, presenting a perspective that may not be commonly understood in the room. One strategy is to just let it all out there and that can be the right thing in, in some circumstances. And another strategy is to calibrate and it drives my daughters completely nuts that I calibrate. But my job is to be effective in policy, and sometimes that means you have to adjust to make sure people can hear you. Um, we have another question in the Q&A from Claudia Caro. I wonder how professional women can deal with ageism. I'm a person in my 50s. I will need and want to work as long as possible, but worry about my career and growth path. Do you have advice to keep cultivating a dynamic career trajectory? What a great question. Um, Yes, I, I do. And I say, so I'm 60. I just turned 60 this year. During the pandemic, I let my hair grow from brown to this color, uh, which is, and I'm short, which is a, also totally a thing. So I am observing the switch in hair color. Um, it, first of all, it's very noticeable. It's a very big change, but wow, does it change people's behavior around, her, around you? Now you really as a woman, as you get older, you start to get invisible in certain ways and you get really invisible really fast when your hair is this color, I have to say. Um, and so I think my advice has to do with um, making sure that people see your dynamism in ways that is not just about how you physically show up in a meeting, right? So for me, that means being prepared, being authoritative, um, working on things that I have energy about so that I can convey that energy so that in the rooms that I am in, people hear the force of my ideas and they hear my um, commitment to them and my enthusiasm for them. Because that sort of breaks through the, oh, this is a little old lady, you know, sitting at the table with us, uh, which is totally, you can see sometimes that's what people are thinking. Um, so that's about, um, the energy that you convey and the preparedness that you walk into a situation with. It's another example of like, you don't get to fake it till you make it, right? You have to really um, have a strategy to, to convey your dynamism and to convey your, frankly, your worth when people start to discount it. Um, but I think that's, a, for me, it's always been about being prepared uh, and making sure that I have command of my subject and that I make it clear how much I care about it. I hope that's helpful. 
And and I also wanted to just, while we wait for more questions from the audience, you did talk about in the book, work-life balance and how important it was your husband was so supportive and especially while you were in the White House. Um, and then you became an empty nester. And that was also a transition. And I just wondered if you wanted to just add a few words about the role of family in your career. Yeah. Um, so I turned down a lot of stuff when my kids were little, including a job in the Clinton administration because I had toddlers at the time. Um, and I don't regret making those decisions. I don't regret saying no to things because my family came first. Um, but it's a different decision for everybody, right? So I don't think there's one way to do this. Um, I think there are as many different ways to balance work and your life as there are people. Um, uh, but I did agonize about it a lot. And my children, my daughters were teenagers when I went into the White House. They were gone in, in university or beyond by the time I left. And so when I was writing the book, I asked them, hey, how, how did that go? <laughs> I realized, right, that they were adults and I could, I could kind of check in and get their input. And in fact, they contributed a section uh, of the, the chapter on um, balancing work and family. And what I was just dumbfounded by was that they didn't understand the question. Um, what, I tell the story in the book of one of them as an adult found on a bookshelf, a book that my husband had given me for Mother's Day when she was a toddler that was called, My Mother Worked, But I Still Turned Out Okay. And she thought this was hilarious. Um, he had given it to me because I was really agonizing about whether I, I like, I didn't, I wasn't sure I was the same kind of mother that I had had because I was in the workforce. Um, and she and both of my daughters kind of didn't understand the question. They, could, they were surprised that I had agonized about it because of course their experience growing up was they had two parents who worked outside of the home and who also communicated to them that they were the most important thing. And they didn't really have any doubt about that. And, you know, what they wrote was, look, I learned that both moms and dads keep the household together. I watched you guys support each other in the work that you were doing in the world. And I grew up with the expectation that I was going to do work in the world too. And they are, by the way. So um, what I learned from that and what I try to convey to people who are agonizing about it is that you have to find the balance that works for you. And in our case, the balance meant for most of the time our kids were growing up doing work that allowed for us to be home at dinner time. That was kind of our barometer. Um, and supporting each other as each of us were going through busy times. Um, and that kind of all got shot to hell when I got to the White House because I was working much, much longer hours and my husband stepped up and I have to say, choosing a partner wisely is a really good strategy. I got very lucky in the partner department. Now, I wanted to make sure that the audience have, if you have any questions, please either put them in the Q&A or raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you about your own experiences. Um, and in the meantime, I did have a, another couple of questions, but one of them is, you know, you told us to dare to be disliked. And President Obama was recently speaking at a political rally and he was heckled. And afterwards he said, it's different from when I ran for president because it's not daring to be disliked, it's being vilified, right? In, in a lot of ways. And, and ultimately in some cases, this has led to violence as we've seen yeah. with the attack on Paul Pelosi. So yeah. I wondered how that affects your advice about daring to be disliked, just given the polarized political environment, one in which, you know, President Obama himself says, it's not like when I was running for president. It's not. I have to, the atmosphere is, is frankly, dangerously toxic. And I do think that there are gradations, right? There's taking criticism because people disagree with your policy views, which is part of the job. And, there, and there's being called unreasonable, terrible names, which sometimes is part of the job. And then there's having your life threatened, which should never be part of the job. Um, and, uh, you know, it was striking even then that about a third of the country, for example, believed President Obama was a Muslim, which he is not. Um, 
but a third of the country is a lot of people to believe something which is just false. Um, and and he dealt with a fair amount of crazy, even as president. There was, you know, every president going back generations has given a, an address, for example, just on the first day of school. It's like a video address. Um, and nobody has ever said boo about it until President Obama gave his first one and people lost their minds at, and accused him of trying to indoctrinate their children. Um, so the, he dealt with a fair amount of crazy. But having said that, the, the, um, I, I mean, I lay it at the feet, frankly, of the advent of social media. The, the, um, the crazy has gotten much worse. People are in their own kind of news loops um, and we, that serve to reinforce their own views rather than um, uh, expose them to events as they actually unfold. You know, like the fact that there is a active conversation or even sneering at Paul Pelosi for having gotten attacked is, um, you know, is I think an indication of just how sordid this has all become. So that is of a different order of magnitude than daring to be disliked. Um, and um, seeking public office, um, seeking to be a public servant should never, never expose someone um, you know, to people attacking you physically, ever. And the fact that we're in that kind of environment, I think is a very dangerous thing. And um, honestly, I think we all need to ask ourselves um, how important democracy is to us and whether it's important enough to stand up and defend it because it is very much in danger. And Frank, I think multiracial democracy, which is what we have been proud of in the United States, even though it has never been perfect, um, is in danger. And if we lose it here, I don't have a lot of confidence in its ability to linger anywhere else in the world. Um, and what that means for us all, I think is really, really devastating. So that goes well beyond whether or not you're popular when you're in office. Um, that speaks to whether or not as a society we can agree on like what the truth is, even if we disagree on where we need to go. We have a, another question in the Q&A. Um, I'm wondering um, how you maintain a positive outlook in such a toxic and difficult time in our culture. It feels like our culture is going in a negative and cruel social spiral and I'm not sure how we get out of it. Yeah, boy, it's a very scary time. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm wired to be an optimist, but I do definitely get scared about where we are. Um, but I, I, I reflected about this really hard when I was writing the book and part because I was writing the book, um, while I was writing the book, my father um, had a stroke and then died. And so I spent a lot of time in Michigan where I grew up and in, uh, in the house that I grew up in, which happens to be my parents were staunch Democrats, but it, they, they have, happened to live in an area with a lot of Republicans. And I'd go for walks every day in, in the neighborhood where I grew up and thinking about the people who had lived in the various houses, um, who are people that I loved, people I grew up with. Uh, and the people who live in those houses now are not so different. Uh, except I know that a lot of them were Trump supporters, which I needless to say, I was not. And some of them were maybe, um, I mean, I think if you're a Trump supporter, that probably means you have the same views on immigrants as President Trump did. And my parents were immigrants from Latin America. Um, you know, my name is Munoz for heaven's sakes. Um, and so I wrestled with this, like I, and when my dad passed, you know, the neighbors brought food and their sympathies and their support. And I didn't know what their politics were. And I, frankly, I didn't want to know what their politics were, but they were still able to behave like neighbors. Um, and that gave me a lot of food for thought. I, if I'm going to be part of the solution in an environment where we are vilifying each other for what we believe, I don't think I can vilify people for what they believe. I could be troubled by it. I could be appalled by it. 
but I honestly, I, it, it may, you may find that it sounds hokey to say this, but I believe this down to my bones. I think that pathway out of this moment that we're in is involves love and the capacity to behave with love as your motivator. And that's what I try to do. And it's not always easy. Um, but it, um, it's part of the reason that I can feel optimistic because the work that I'm doing now and as I'm involved in helping create organizations, including an organization called welcome.us, which is helping create pathways for regular people to sponsor immigrants and refugees, help them bring them here. And it might surprise you to know that more than 150,000 Americans have stood up to sponsor Ukrainian families to bring them um, to the United States. And thousands stood up for Afghan evacuees when we withdrew from Afghanistan. And we are now recruiting Americans to stand up and sponsor Venezuelan families because the government created a program to help them resettle here. And so for all of the ugly and the yelling, regular folks from both sides of the aisle um, are standing up to support people fleeing Ukraine and fleeing Venezuela in, in a moment of need. And that gives me a lot of hope. Well, I think that's a wonderful, inspiring note to end the book talk on because it reminds us of your principle of kindness and that it is out there and the kind of fundamental American decency for which we've always been vaunted, right, globally, this unique success of a diverse democracy that is marked by fundamental decency, that that is our collective North Star. That, it really that, is who we are. It has to be who we are, and we have to fight for it. Exactly. So I think that's a wonderful note to end on, and I want to thank Cecilia Munoz for this terrific conversation that we've had. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for the thoughtful, insightful questions about both making you know your own career work, but also thinking collectively about the greater good. Um, and I briefly just wanted to mention our upcoming, our next talk which will feature Tanya Hernandez and her book, Racial Innocence with commentary by Enid Trucio Haynes. That will take place on Wednesday, November 16, also at 12 noon Pacific. The book is an exploration through the case law of anti-black bias in the Latino community. And so she does it across a range of areas using uh, litigation as her source materials and so I do hope you'll be able to join us for this, the final uh, fall book talk. And then we will be putting together the spring book talk series and we'll be sending information about that in the near future. So thank you again, Cecilia Munoz and you, our audience for joining us today. Thanks everybody. <laughs>